So I'm going to talk to you today about, um, I think, a very fascinating line of, of musical instruments that, that came about as the technology allowed it to come around, which, as it turns out, is very much the case with most of the musical instruments that we know. The technology and the needs kind of come together, and they create a thing that can only exist by then. Uh, and, and by that, I mean that if, if I took a, a Steinway piano back to the year 1800, but I didn't have any strings on it, they would be unable to string this piano. There's nothing that can take the tension of a Steinway. They wouldn't know what to do with it. The technology has to come together. So that's one of the things that happened here. Uh, it always helps to start with a, a short joke. And, and as I get, get into these uh, instruments, you'll understand where this is coming from. Yes, uh, if you don't hit the pedal right, it, it could give you quite a lurch. So, the idea of electricity and musical instruments, uh, you know, was by no means new by the time some of these instruments came to, to pass. Uh, as early as 1884, uh, uh, Adolf or Hermann von Helmholtz had put together this fairly elaborate thing with an actual keyboard in the front. And what it does is uh, it energizes a set of tuning forks that are tuned to these resonant cavities. This is called the Helmholtz resonator. And it's like a little, uh, a little organ kind of thing. Uh, later, uh, a fellow by the name of Thaddeus Cahill in Hollyhock, uh, Massachusetts, put together the dynamophone or telharmonium, an organ-like thing that, that used no electronics, but it used electrical motors to turn huge wheels uh, that would create the tones. And apparently, this thing weighed in the, the neighborhood of 200 tons. <laughs> He built, he built two of them and then had, had pretty much bankrupted himself and nobody wanted to buy them. So, so to that end, uh, you, know, uh, you know, rather than act as a survey of all these kind of interesting electrical instruments, let's talk about the ones that were kind of focused on uh, like a dynamic response of so an electric piano with, with a response you know, from something that's, that's going to hit it and, and it's going to be hammered. And, and by that way, we'll be able to more nearly, uh, you know, focus in on this particular set of instruments. So uh, our next uh, character that enters the scene is, uh, if, if you're a chemist or a physicist, you've heard of this guy, uh, uh, Wal Walter Nernst. Walter Nernst. And Nernst uh, was extremely important in uh, uh, spectroscopy and chemistry, particularly in infrared uh, spectroscopy. He largely invented the subject. Uh, but he got interested in electronics and electricity as it's coming about. The amplifying tube has just been uh, created and is beginning to show up in the world. And so he had the idea, well, if we had a permanent magnet with a, a coil wrapped around the magnet, uh, if a string vibrates in the neighborhood of that coil, it's going to set up a signal in the coil, and we could pick that up with an amplifier and play it. And so he's in Germany, and he gets in with Bechstein, and they create a piano that they call the, the Neo Bechstein. And so you can see that fellow over here, um, a little closer in, and we can see what's really going on. Here are the electromagnets. There's a coil of wire underneath, and then each set of strings is grouped into five, and we have a very interesting action. So imagine this is where the key is. I'm going to push down on the lever. This is going to come up. It's going to hit this little stop block, and then this tiny hammer is going to come up and pop the string. He did this because if he hit it with a regular hammer, the, the signal apparently was uh, considered to be too much. Uh, so it was a, a way of producing a piano-like sound that, uh, that, you know, being a scientist more than a musician, I think uh, that's sort of where he stopped with the idea. Um, one of the difficulties at the time was, uh, you know, the, the problems that led up to World War II. Germany, uh, uh, after World War I, uh, was, was literally in, in huge financial difficulty. Uh, things did not get any better after the Great Depression started in the 1920s, which was actually worldwide, not just the United States. And so 
Beckstein was, uh, was kind of on his knees, and they were not going to be able to continue with this idea. And, uh, you know, I think Nurse was a little, you know, troubled by this, but, you know, not a problem. A new guy is going to show up into our story, and his name is Benjamin Meissner. So let's, uh, let's keep his name in mind as we go to the next slide. So in 1931, uh, this idea of an electric signal being created by having a string moving close to a, a magnetic coil has caught a bunch of people's attention, uh, including Adolf Rickenbacker, who uh, would invent the electromagnetic pickup uh, for the frying pan uh, uh, steel guitar. So this is actually the first electric guitar uh, that ever was. Uh, they started in 1930, started introducing them in 1932, and uh, very quickly, our friend Benjamin Meissner comes in, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, but he comes into the story, uh, and it it made uh, Rickenbacker and and several others actually kind of split up a bit. The uh, National String Instrument Corporation falls apart, but other uh, companies, uh, including the Epiphone, come out of it. So here's an interesting uh, newspaper uh, thing. This was called the Electric Dog, and it was actually invented by Benjamin Meissner in, in uh, 1912. It was a little cart that could follow a signal from a flashlight. Mm. So you take your flashlight and you shine it. Actually, you could shine it on the floor, and the cart would follow the light anywhere it went. Well, people thought this was pretty wild. It's really one of the first electronic controlled uh, uh, devices that were out there. And his partner in this would split away from him and, and actually go into radio control as uh, the thing that he made his, his fortune in life around. So uh, Meissner, very inventive kind of fellow, uh, early into radio, and he invents the cat's hair whisker, which is a way of taking a little piece of uh, uh, gallium and putting a little wire to it, and it becomes a semiconductor. And if you get on the right sensitive spot, suddenly you can hear radio waves uh, coming in. If you have an antenna and a good ground, that's all it takes. No amplification needed. So he comes up with that. And he traveled a lot, and he wrote to people a lot. And among those was Walter Nernst. And so he actually traveled to Germany, picked up on these early ideas that Nernst had. Nernst never tried to patent those ideas. and so. Uh, uh, Meisner comes back and he starts patenting the idea of electronic uh, pickups. He becomes uh, ultimately a very critical figure. He was the very first patent troll. Now, what is a patent troll? A patent troll is somebody who patents the whole area around something that, that's likely new, and then the moment somebody else comes up with something, you owe me money. You owe me money. Well, that was him in spades. The guy, uh, his Wikipedia uh, article is, is tragically brief because people like to talk about him. Uh, he was something of a, <laughs> of a character. But uh, he had uh, been working on this idea of uh, you know, musical tones with electronics and electricity. He actually came up with a, the idea of a theremin a little after theremin came up with his idea, and so he wasn't able to bring that forward. But he was able to bring forward this idea of electrical pickups with moving wires. Um, he was an avid reader, traveled to Europe, picked up on everything that he could. And so uh, by the early 1930s, he's putting together this concept for an electric piano. His first one was uh, uh, like an upright piano. Um, it had magnetic pickups, no soundboard, a very simplified action, uh, housed in a little, uh, little upright, a uh, uh, pedal swell. Then he tries it on a Wurlitzer uh, baby grand, and his uh, relationship with Wurlitzer would continue for the rest of his life. Uh, the, the soundboard was removed, the pickups added. Uh, it had a very long sustained tone, which some musicians said, do you know that's not really as, as desirable as you would think? And, and it just went right past him. It was sort of like, no, no, that's what you want. <laughs> so, you know, next is a Baldwin seven foot uh, piano, and uh, he takes his grand piano and he puts this on there. And that begins to get people's real attention because now, you know, gosh, you know, that, that's a pretty astonishing sort of sound. So here's uh, 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 Meissner working in his uh, uh, workshop. Between 31 and 34, he took out over 10 patents 
on this idea of just electrical pickup alone. Several <coughs> ways to do it. Uh, he's kind of patenting the whole field. Uh, Epiphone licensed uh, 10 of these patents, and if you get an early Epiphone guitar, you'll see each of those patents uh, uh, labeled out on the uh, little label that, that Meissner insisted must be stuck on each guitar with his name on it. Uh, and Arthur Ansley of Ansley Radio uh, kind of you know, grabbed up on this whole concept, and he, he thought, well, maybe we could bring out an ele electronic piano. In 1935, uh, in response to the poor business of, uh, of pianos, uh, piano sales in America had boomed until 1922, and then radio begins to really make a, a headway in, and interest in the piano uh, collapses. Mm -hmm. And so between 1922 and 1932, uh, we went from over 800 makers to fewer than 200 makers in America just through that. And of course, uh, the, the Depression did uh, no one any favors. And you know, by 1935, we're down to 150 uh, you know, total makers in America. But big guys have come together and said, what can we do? And in response to decorators' needs and, and the people out there that are kind of begging for something that will fit into my decor. They came up with the idea of a new type of piano, a console piano, meaning it's very much sh shorter than the old uprights. And so it's only about 32 to 34 inches tall. And you can fit paintings over the, the, the top of it. And you know it kind of just fits right in the room and doesn't take up too much room. And some people have come up with scaling that allowed the piano to sound at least reasonably well. So Ansley came up with this concept for a piano, and if it's going to have an electric pickup, well then why don't we add everything else to it as well? So there is phonograph, we'll see that in a second, a radio behind this panel, and uh, you know everything is kind of kind of built into this instrument. So here's the phonograph up close. Here's the radio up close. Uh, you know, kind of inspired Story and Clark. Uh, to to add these same features when it was almost coincidentally coming up with its idea for a piano. So putting a radio on a piano wasn't particularly new in 1924 because things were starting to collapse. Uh, Waydick had introduced the radio player, a player piano with a radio uh, attached in it, and there's the big radio <laughs> stuck into the side of the piano. Uh, this went nowhere fast because all it did was make a, a, a piano that nobody wanted more expensive. Uh, with the radio that they did want. So, uh, you know, people didn't glom onto this. These are exceptionally rare if you ever find one today. This is a quick uh, view of the schematic for Ansley, and the only reason for showing this is, is simply to show that, you know, there's uh, quite a number of stages in order to amplify so that you can, can get the, Im the, the sound out that you want at the end. And these guys were really putting their effort into trying to get a high quality sound. So. Ansley, looking at the various ways of getting a, the initial signal, had come on the one, the alternate way of actually doing this. One has the, the, the magnet with the coil and the string. The other has effectively a capacitive effect. So we'll have a little button here with a high voltage on it. And the string is here at ground. And as the string goes back and forth, it'll change the capacitance and then you can pick that signal up. So Ansley said, ah, that's the way to go. It has a little more fidelity, a little more total uh, sound response than the magnetic uh, pickup. It is exceptionally dangerous. This is a very high voltage, and you just don't want to ever put your mitts uh, you know, into the piano. So uh, you can actually see an image. We have one of these in the collection, and here's the cable that comes under the strip that's going to energize everything, and here are the little buttons here. All right, and then as the string vibrates, then the signal coming back through this high voltage will change, and it will allow you to uh, pick it up and amplify it and, and make it work. One of the difficulties with this approach is that it's exceptionally sensitive to anything else that's going on, like noise in the room. In the 1930s, uh, fluorescent lights are only starting to get introduced, and all other electrical noise is, is, is not really well known. So it, they would put 
an aluminum foil all around the, the case of the piano. If, if you go into this thing, the back, it's got a, a padded back with aluminum foil on it. It's all grounded. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, modern fluorescent lights or these LED lights, uh, it doesn't work at all because all you hear is from the LED lights going the whole time. So, uh, extremely sensitive, but it's got its problems. Here's Arthur Ansley, and uh, he's, he's at one of uh, the early pianos that he came up with. Frankly, I have a feeling that if they brought that forward, they might have actually been able to make a little bit better go of it. But, and, you know, he's already gone with this more ambitious look of a piano with other things added into it, which, of course, jacks up the cost. So he releases their first pianos in mid-1938. Um, they advertise it as having a, a harpsichord sound, which means that if you don't amplify it at all, and you're just playing along, remember that this has strings, and it has hammers, just like a regular piano, but it has no soundboard. So without any amplifier going, this, the sound is very, very quiet. It's just the string vibrating in the ear. Then when you turn the amplifier up, bring the volume up, then you can really begin to hear the piano going. So it would, it would sound like a, a, a piano, a phonograph, a radio, or a harpsichord all in one. Um, if you know what a harpsichord sounds like, you know that mm, maybe not so much. But uh, in America at the time, we were pretty liberal in the way that we saw things. And so uh, there wasn't a whole lot of pushback on that whole harpsichord uh, question. The sales were promising, but they were hampered by a press release right at this time from Story and Clark that said they're working with RCA Victor, the biggest electronics firm in the world, to come out with their own version of such a piano. And so they did. And uh, they, uh, they, they, they partnered with some very important people. Uh, one of those was Robert Budlong. Uh, if you've ever seen one of the little uh, beehive radios, uh, and I'll show you one in just a second, uh, you know, they're, they're often, uh, you know, with ribs and, and, and round parts and, and curls. He had been, uh, you know, hired by Zenith with the idea of, I, we want you to make a radio that, quote, looks like a radio, not something else. And, and so, you know, let your design, uh, you know, ideas go wild. Art Deco is all the rage at the time, and you can see his desk has got the rounded uh, ends and then the, 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 the ribbing along the front. You know, this is the way he liked to, to see uh, designs in life. He was actually a very good designer, and uh, the, the effect that he came up with was, was quite startling. So he brings this radical new design of a strong Art Deco to Story and Clark. They love it. They actually pick two different designs from him. And they come up with a piano that looks something like this. And then here is the, the, uh, the little beehive radio. You can see the ribbing. You can see the ribbing here. It's very much the same kind of concept. You know, these, these curves and ribs to, uh, to, to make it look like the wind would sweep right by it. So an excellent, you know, streamlined appearance. And then here it is uh, in all of its glory. And there's a wonderful example downstairs. And uh, I'll let you know ahead of time that I turned it on before we started the lecture today. So we can go down and, and have a look at it uh, a little bit later and I can show you what it does. Uh, all closed up, it looks like it's ready to take off. It looks a little bit like a spaceship. And uh, you know, it, from any angle, uh, it's just a very pretty piano. It's also a fairly interesting musical instrument. <laughs> But it isn't exactly simply an, an, an amplified piano, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, because RCA was involved, uh, they knew a lot about acoustics. Uh, they had uh, done you know, a huge amount of work before amplification from electronics to go from horns to uh, cabinets that have you know, horns built in that have good uh, dynamic response. And so they came up with this idea of Here's the loudspeaker, but then the back end goes through a channel thing like that that exponentially uh, winds out to this huge opening here. And so the bass response on this is just tremendously good. Uh, for the time, it's about as good as it gets. There is no such thing as a woofer again. So this is kind of an all-purpose speaker, 
Well, one of the problems is that the low frequency off of one of these uh, all-purpose speakers is the weakest sound. Now, it's brought out and it's one of the stronger sounds. So you've got a very good balance uh, in the thing. Uh, the electronics for the Ansley, uh, you know, uh, quite advanced. Uh, the power supply is here. We have a rectifier for the regular tubes and then a rectifier for that high voltage that's gonna go out, a separate uh, high voltage circuit. Very, very clean. And then here's the amplifier with these two, uh, uh, two A3 tubes, they work in a push-pull mode. And so uh, you can get, uh, uh, you know, roughly 10 watts with low, low distortion, 20 watts with, with uh, a little over 0.5% distortion. For Story and Clark, uh, the Story Tone, uh, the, the power supply is a little simpler because we, we're going to use the magnetic pickups with them. But now we have a 2A3 quad push-pull. So this allows you to have even more power, a uh, lower impedance, and so a very, very good response uh, to the sound. Here's the schematic, and it's much more elaborate than what we had with the Story Tone. Uh, there's, there's a fair amount going on. And part of this is uh, using the little transformer here, we have uh, the very first example of a unity coupled uh, uh, audio circuit. And uh, Macintosh would take uh, advantage of this and come up with their uh, Macintosh Mac 30s, which had the first unity couple. This is actually my Mac 30, it's, a, it's one of a pair. So imagine that one channel is on this one, one channel is on another one. And, uh, you know, as far as audio concerned, it's, it's among the best that you can get. So, you know, even in, in the 1949 to you know, 1969, uh, you know, this, this little amplifier ruled. In order to make the uh, uh, Story and Clark sensitive enough, they had learned that they also needed to magnetize the string right in the area of the pickup. So here's the pickup. Here's a little permanent magnet ostensibly being held by the technician and so a technician would take this and as you know you can magnetize something by sweeping a magnet over an unmagnetized thing and then it will pick up uh, a, a magnetic uh, field itself and when you did that then you could actually voice the piano with the magnetization if you went too far you take a little ac signal and you you put the ac to it and that will demagnetize it and you can go back again they thought this would be cool. Uh, it's going to be great for the technician to be able to pick up uh, a, you know, a, a new job. Um, <laughs> they, yeah, people were thinking uh, that, that folks really wanted to get into something. But this does work very well. So, you know, here's some of the features. Uh, there's what they call the uh, tremolo on the left. It's actually more of a, a spatial uh, uh, feature than, than a true tremolo. The tremolo would actually come out about the same time, but they don't actually use a true tremolo in, in this uh, uh, piano. Uh, On-off switch on the right, um, and, and with these things, you're kind of ready to go. Um, yeah, they said with no amplification, the, the piano's had a harpsichord sound, and uh, as I said in the, the little lecture, you know, we can only smile at that. but. Uh, but it really does produce an interesting tone, and we're going to you know, get to hear that uh, in just a, a moment. So this was all ready uh, for the great 1939 World's Fair in New York. There were two World's Fairs going on at the same time, one on the West Coast uh, and one on the East Coast in New York. The East Coast Fair was the, by far the largest, and so RCA was, uh, was planning a, a big uh, you know, thrust with this. When it came to designing the the phonograph and the radio, they actually turned to this man, John Vassos. John had been working with RCA for quite a while, and uh, he'd come up with this phonograph that's all in chrome. Uh, this is a, a, a little uh, a battery powered phonograph. If you find one of these on eBay, they, in, in rough condition, they start about $2,500. Hmm. And in excellent condition, you can pay $10,000 for these. They're extremely desirable. We do not have one of those. But here is the, the phonograph and the radio for the story tone, and you can see it a little closer here. So he's, he's done a good job with, with he's got buttons, so we can uh, you know, dial in the stations. And then this uh, ovoid on, on the bar as the pickup for the phonograph, uh, just a, a very neat sort of design uh, to, to you know, say you know, we have two big designers 
you know, working on a thing. And this, this was a time um, when design was, was everywhere. Locomotives were being streamlined, cars were being streamlined, and industrial design was, was huge. Uh, the Henry Dreyfus and the, the, the Dreyfus engine is, is a very recognizable steam engine even today. And uh, the, the Honeywell, uh, the little round uh, dial thing that you would have on your wall at home, that was a Dreyfus design and it lasted for, for 50 years. So, you know, a good industrial design. Uh, the story tone and Pratt Reed pianos were, were based on a standard console style, as we've talked about, uh, with the absence of a soundboard. Uh, the piano makes use of this fixed cast metal bridge, which again gives the string something very, very firm to work against. And so all we're going to do is, is beat against the air as it dissipates its energy, meaning that the sustain is exceptionally long for these pianos. Uh, the electric pickups are positioned along the length of the piano, one for every note, uh, rather than bunched up uh, like they use for Nernst. And so with one for every note, just like with an electric guitar, you know, you always have the ability to make that one note balance with everybody else. When you push down on the pedal for the story tone, it, it causes this little gear to move up like this, and that turns this potentiometer, and that's where the volume is, is made. And then you can see the electric pickup. Here's the magnet here. Over time, uh, you can see the little hairs of, uh, uh, of steel falling down. It's not generally known, but uh, iron material rains in from space all the time. And so natural dust will always have a certain amount of this cosmic dust, this uh, you know, iron, iron ferrous type material, iron and nickel uh, coming in. And so if a magnet is left undisturbed for a long, long time, it will always have this little hair, this beard of, uh, of magnetic material that is picked up. Uh, just by sitting there. So this is Martha Sherman, and Martha had just graduated from Juilliard, and she was picked up by uh, a story and chorus to play at the World's Fair and to you know demonstrate the story tone piano. And here she is in her little rotating ring, <laughs> so that people could watch uh, you know uh, her play. Um, she had only one disadvantage: television was being introduced at the fair. And so on the other side of this is the big television exhibit. And it's a little bit like Children's Museum or Sigil. <laughs> 200,000 are over at the Children's Museum. Here we are over here. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was really interesting. They, they even built one TV completely out of a new material called Lexan plexiglass so that people would believe that it wasn't just smoke and mirrors and, and, and that they, they had some kind of light show going on inside. You could see the electronics and see everything through the TV because that's what people needed. Um, so, you know, between TV and the story tone, uh, RCA had a lot to talk about. And by the way, this was uh, one of the ads that, that came out in the, the trade magazines that, uh, you know, have the, the people, you know, a wonderful Art Deco, you know, ad. Uh, just, you know, a, a really kind of a, a, a big show. So uh, after the World's Fair, uh, uh, Martha Sherman then tours the country uh, during the, the uh, year 1940. Uh, she even came to Greenland. And uh, she would come to the music stores and talk about the, the story tone piano. They would have one everywhere she went. And uh, you know, apparently she made, you know, quite a splash out of it. Um, there was a, a, an effort to get this thing into uh, commercialization, so they, uh, they already had uh, uh, Earl Hines, Bob Hines, uh, as one of the musicians in their stable. And so they encouraged Hines to, uh, to do a record on the story tone. And uh, he, he chose two pieces, one that he'd never recorded before, Child of a Disordered Brain, uh, and then Body and Soul, which had been recorded by everybody. Uh, I'm going to let you listen to a little bit of both of these, and then we'll talk about it. This is Child of a Disordered Brain.
So a pretty hot uh, sort of piece that uh, uh, you know you can definitely recognize the, the piano elements of it. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it, he hasn't made use of any of the things that the piano can do. He clearly doesn't understand this thing. And then uh, body and soul, uh, he he uses it, but now it comes off. I think just a little weirder. Just give it a listen. So that's the only record uh, that uh, we know of where the story tone was actually used in a, a recording, um, and uh, you know it, it, it's out there; it exists. But uh, you know, that that was not going to stop marketing. And so uh, mm -hmm. story tone or yeah, story tone and RCA, you know, put together a two 12-inch record set that would go out to the various uh, uh, sellers of, of pianos and music stores. Uh, so that people could understand what the story tone could do. And I wanted to just uh, play a, f a few minutes of, of that from one of the sides of, of one of those records so that you could get a, a sense of what did, what did RCA and Story and Clark want to say in 1939? This is Martha Sherman playing everything. The Story and Clark Story Tone, voiced by RCA Victor, is the most important development in the past 200 years of piano history. The Story Tone is, in every sense of the word, a piano. It has the strings, hammers, keyboard, and action of a true piano. The only difference is the Story Tone embodies a new system of amplification. Of course, every piano must be amplified. The conventional piano uses a wooden sounding board for this purpose. The story tone piano, however, eliminates the wooden sounding board, and in its stead, magnetic pickups are placed behind each string. They pick up the vibrations and send them to a high fidelity speaker. In reality, then, the story tone speaks through a high fidelity system. Now, that's the only fundamental difference between the story tone and the conventional piano. But we find that this new system of amplification makes a tremendous difference in tonal quality. If we examine the conventional piano, we find that the string performs two primary functions. It not only supplies the fundamentals of tone, but it must also vibrate a wooden sounding board for amplification. Wooden sounding boards, however, are not ideally sensitive. That is the only way to produce big, deep, rich qualities on a conventional piano is to use very long strings, which automatically means a very large piano. But today, People really need and want a small piano. And now there is a small piano that gives you what you want, the story tone. High fidelity amplification is the answer. Magnetic pickups are obviously much more sensitive than a wooden sounding board. They allow the strings in the story tone to vibrate much more beautifully and effectively. The result is that the sustaining power of a story tone is several times greater than that of the conventional piano. And we hear lovely overtones and harmonics that have never been heard before in any piano. Because of this system of amplification, the spinet style of the story tone is no longer a handicap. The strings in the story tone fulfill only one function, to produce tone. The result is that for the first time, we have in the story tone a true concert spinet. No longer does one have to pound the keys in order to vibrate a wooden sounding board and secure the desired volume. The slightest touch of the responsive story tone keyboard 
produces greater tone qualities than were ever before possible. Now, those of you who want all the qualities of a large piano, but who also want the beauty and convenience of a spinner, can now solve the problem perfectly with the story tone. You will not have lost a single quality of tone. On the contrary, you will have gained resources of endless variety, including colors and interpretive effects that have never before been attainable. Story and Clark, in conjunction with RCA Victor, have truly produced a concert piano in a spinet form. The one and only concert spinet, the story tone. So she was very enthusiastic, <laughs> and um, and it, and it is an instrument with its own voice. Um, it certainly was not alone in the universe at, at this time. So this is from a, a trade journal uh, as the story tone is coming out, and we find here's the dynatone that we talked about. There's story tone. Uh, here's a little uh, organ attachment that you can put on your piano. This is the Meisner uh, work uh, here. Uh, the Hardman and Peck Company came out with one, and then on this side are the various uh, new electric organs that are coming out. So this idea of electronics and the musical instruments is something that's really in the air, and it's going around, and and everybody's got something. So it's just, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, they were not inexpensive. So the, the Dynatone sold for $325, uh, and I have no idea how they, they managed to make that work, but uh, the story in Clark was 645 and then if you wanted the, the piano, I mean the, the, the radio and the phonograph and the bench, that was an extra $145. So you can buy a DeSoto <laughs> new for $645. Four door with 90 horsepower. So, you know, it, it was a, a time when, uh, you know, you would have to really want such a thing. Um, America would then enter the war uh, in mid-1942, well, and of course, in, in, in December of 1941, but by mid-1942, uh, all manufacturing had begun to, or had been shifted over to the war effort. And so if you made pianos, then you're now retooling your factory to make something for the war. If you make cars, you're making uh, airplane parts, and so on and so forth. For the next four years, we wouldn't really be able to, uh, to make anything that was, you know, just for luxury, just for fun. It was all for the war effort. So uh, the, the, all the, you know, piano manufacturing, you know, comes to a stop at this point. Uh, once it's over, uh, it's not over yet. So for, for uh, uh, Ansley and their Dynatone, um, they had uh, forced Arthur Ansley, uh, and forced is the right word, to order a bunch of material for the invasion of Japan. Uh, and so he had done so, and the factory was all tooled up to build a bunch of communication equipment for the invasion of Japan, uh, which, as you know, never occurred. Uh, when things like that would be stopped, uh, they would just cancel the orders. So, you know, Ansley went back to the, the War Department and said, you know, I've got all of my money tied up in inventory I can't use. And they said, not my problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, they were implacable. Uh, it was pretty hard for manufacturers at the time uh, when the sort of thing would go. And, and ultimately, uh, Ansley wasn't able to make a go of it. And Ansley Radio uh, disappears in 1947, and uh, they were the last thing he tried to do was somehow bring back the piano. He clearly loved this idea of the electric piano, but there was no money to do it. Story and Clark returned to business, uh, but they sensed that uh, you know America was tired. They wanted to buy different things, including uh, housing, and if they wanted a piano, they wanted it you know relatively inexpensive. And so they came back with the, the, the new story tone with a laminated mahogany soundboard. It will never crack. And uh, not necessarily the very best material to make the soundboard out of, but, but sure enough, it'll never crack. So, <laughs> so they got a plywood soundboard, and, and uh, you can find those all over the place now. So the traditional piano is, is where we return. 
all of this wonderful stuff about the electric piano almost disappears except for here we go so Harold Rhodes during the war Rhodes as a young man was was working on B-17 bombers and and he had noticed that uh, you know some of the uh, high alloy aluminum rod that you would use uh, as, as part of the, the plane it made quite a musical noise when when it was struck if you were holding it in your finger and a bit like that and there was quite a tone that came off of it and so he got the idea that well gosh you could probably make a keyboard instrument out of this and rather than have strings you could beat on these little rods he was right it was a, it was actually a good idea uh, he went to the war department and said could I make these for wounded soldiers Oh yeah, that's going to be great press. So he starts making uh, this very, very first, you know, little, uh, you know, piano-like thing for the soldiers. He quickly found out that while the you know, the alloy for the aluminum uh, was neat, uh, there was a hardened steel that was available that was even better. And so the tongs or the tines that are in these things are actually usually this uh, high alloy uh, steel that's been uh, very heavily hardened. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, the only you know difficulty that I saw with it is if you want to tune it, uh, you have to grind. You, you really you can't cut it, uh, and and you can't chip it. It's, it's almost it's, it's real light. And they would uh, they would neck down the edges and uh, and, and stick these things into uh, a bar. And so here you see the young lady. She's poised in bed, uh, you know, playing her piano. Um, here's this, the wounded service man. He's on the side of the bed playing his piano. And then uh, this is the guy we'll talk about, Wayne Capel, in just a moment. So Rhodes is really liking this concept, and he decided after the war, let's start a company. And so he starts a company to build a little piano called the Pre-Piano. And so here's a Pre-Piano, and uh, he, he would actually even build it into this uh, uh, kind of seated arrangement <laughs> like a a child's uh, you know, school desk with the piano on it and a little seat and for $199 uh, you could have a little piano. Uh, what did it sound like? Well, we have one of those and you know, here's the pre-piano. And we have a little amplifier built inside, so with, with no amp, it's uh, it's quiet. You could imagine practicing in your room, and then with the amp turned on and up, then you got a little bit of. So a neat, neat little instrument. It weighs about 20 pounds, so it's very portable. You can pick the thing up, no problem. And in fact, you know what to do. Well, let's go get a great pianist and, and, and get him to advertise it for us. So here's the, what it looks like on the inside. Uh, here are the little tines that stick out. These hammers come up and strike the tine. And here's a hammer that's down that's, that's about to strike the tine. There's a speaker built in and then a very simple amplifier here. Very simple in that it's, it's like a little straight uh, amp that would be in a, a little practice amp. So uh, here it is from the back. You can see the other side, see the tines a little more easily. There are the hammers that come up and strike them. This is the schematic, almost nothing to it. Three tubes, a rectifier, uh, a, 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 a preamp uh, stage, and then the 6V6 amplifier. Puts out about four watts, it's all you need. Uh, it does a pretty good job. And they call it the Bantam piano, uh, because pre-piano, you know, Rhodes liked that idea of pre-piano, like this came before the piano, but the Bantam, was what they uh, they marketed the thing at. They got uh, William Capel, who was a dashing, handsome, uh, uh, very brilliant pianist that was coming up uh, in the uh, international world. And his idea was, I'm going to send him on a tour of South America with the pre-piano. And he'll write a little diary entry that we'll show in the, in the newspapers the whole time he's, he's out there. So if you go back, you can find newspapers.com. You can find the, the you know, entries from William Capel. He had it on the airplane, and he's playing on the airplane. And the idea was to show that even, even at 10,000 feet, uh, you know, it doesn't change tune. Or anything. Well, of course it doesn't change tune. <laughs> so you're banging on these rods. Nothing is going to change. 
but it was all for marketing. Uh, unhappily for the world, uh, uh, Capel uh, would die shortly after uh, he went to Australia, and the plane uh, flying back home uh, crashed, and all were lost. So uh, we lost uh, William Capel, but uh, there's lots of recordings on YouTube, and, and he was an interesting pianist. Rhodes was not happy with the, the manufacturing of it. He wanted something that was nicer, something that was more robust, maybe something bigger. Uh, and so by 1948, the end of 48, he decided, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. They, they tried to, to sell the piano at 199 and then 159 and then 129 and finally 89.95. And uh, you know they probably got rid of the last ones, you know, you know down there in the 70 or 80 dollar uh, range, and then and then he's out. But he kept working on the concept, and you know the next thing he came up with was uh, uh, he ran into Leo Fender. Fender encouraged him to reconsider this thing, but you know rather than the sort of homemade tines and such, let's have you know uh, uh, like tuning forks that are that are cast to the right frequency, and then we can tune them in uh, sharply, and then it'll be great. So this was the piano base. This is piano base on the inside. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the musical groups picked up on this idea of the, the uh, piano bass, uh, including one that you will recognize. If you are of a certain age, then you remember where you were when you first heard that song. Uh, the band loved it. And particularly in 1965, CBS uh, you know, buys uh, Leo Fender out, but uh, you know they bring out the, the Fender Rhodes uh, Mark One, uh, 73 note, and you know people have gigged with these ever since. And you gotta want to gig with this piano because <laughs> the, the 73 noter uh, is about 160 pounds, and the 88 noter, which we have one of those. Uh, it's well over 200, and uh, you know Tim and I moved one of those, and, <laughs> and we about busted a gut because you don't you don't expect it. It's like, well, this is just an electronic keyboard. No, this this, this, is, this is a thing. So um, it's it's quite a piano. Uh, Rolliser enters uh, this whole field in 19 uh, in the 1950s uh, again with Meisner uh, coming in with some ideas, and uh, you know they they. They did a, a co-development, and uh, you know they brought out uh, a number of models of Wolitzer. Uh, we actually have uh, a, a neat one uh, here. This is the, the Model 120 from 1964, and there's Marvin Gaye at his uh, uh, Model 120 uh, from about that same period. Uh, it's it's the same kind of concept as the uh, uh, Rhodes sort of instrument, but but uh, a different sound of its own. So when you hear uh, "Heard It Through the Grapevine," you'll immediately recognize that oh, there's a different kind of piano going on. Also, uh, in the early '60s, uh, a, a, a group up in Boston uh, had come up with the idea of uh, you know, putting together like an electric harpsichord. And so again, no soundboard, uh, electronic pickups for each of the notes, and you know this would play into this. Uh, you know, folk revival that's going on, and kind of this early music thing, and, and it did. The Beatles picked up on this. Uh, uh, if you know uh, uh, both sides now, uh, uh, Joni Mitchell, uh, 
you know, that, that's uh, you know, heavily used in that. And in fact, the harpsichord that we have is the one that Johnny had in New York for, for doing that. It came out of the same studio. So, you know, pretty neat. Uh, here's what, uh, what they look like. Uh, the red is simply something to show. This is the, the bridge and it's single strong throughout. And then uh, electronic pickups for everything. And you can change the tones and the Beatles love this. And uh, you know, they, they use it on time and some other uh, uh, pieces. So you know, uh, the, the, the sides are cast aluminum. Uh, it's supposed to be you know, very modern looking and, and it is. It almost looks industrial, uh, but it's a neat, sort of a concept. Uh, a lot of people used it and then it kind of vanished. So what happened? Well, in, you know, in the, the uh, mid 1960s, uh, Robert Moog uh, is, is uh, or Mo, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> uh, as a little boy, I didn't know things, you know, and, and <laughs> I bought Switched On Bach and I thought that was one of the best records I'd ever heard, but I didn't know how to pronounce the guy's name. But Robert Moog, <laughs> excuse me, uh, began to experiment with uh, with analog uh, and synthesis, you know, resulting in in a, a series of uh, you know keyboards that were they, they were uh, you know monotonal. Uh, you got one one note at a time, but but it produced all these weird effects. Some of them uh, were sounds that were much like instruments that you'd heard before, and some were sounds like you'd never heard before. As time goes on, analog synthesis kind of gives way to digital sampling, where we actually take digital samples of, of a particular instrument, and then when you hit that note, you're actually hearing like a photograph of that particular note from that particular piano or harpsichord or other instrument. Um, and of course, the digital, once memory became uh, something that you didn't have to worry about, well, then they be could become quite sophisticated. So right now, Sigal is working with a group in Asheville called Embertone, and we are collecting the sounds of our early keyboards, digitizing them, sampling them, and assigning them to the various notes on the keyboard so that a person could be in the middle of the country with a MIDI keyboard set down and actually play the Volter piano from downstairs. And, and what they will hear is the Volter. And because it's become quite sophisticated, then it really sounds like somebody has recorded the Volter and you're hearing it you know, through your headphones or your speakers. Um, so if you think about conservation, you know, in conservation and, and archiving, we, 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 we want, you know, to make the thing right. We want, to, we want to hold on to it. We want pictures of it. We want descriptions of it. Now we can actually have it sound. And, you know, it's not the first time it's ever been done, but this will be one of the most advanced examples of doing that such that it's really a compelling soundscape when, when you get finished. Uh, you know, the Roland 88, RD88, is something that, uh, you know, people now tour around with, and this is something that, that you can easily put on your arm and, and, and carry around. But it has, of course, the capability of playing, you know, any of our instruments or any of the many packages that you can already get of Fazioli and Steinway and Baldwin and Yamaha pianos. You can pick the grand that you want. There'll always be room for wood and wire, which, you know, a, conven a conventional piano. I note that when Star Wars uh, tours around with, you know, they, they show the images from Star Wars and, and they have uh, various uh, of the old characters, you know, kind of narrate the story. The band still has a real grand piano out there, <laughs> but uh, they also have, have digitized things going on as well. So uh, here, Sigal. Uh, you know, we have examples of the, the story tone, the dynatone, the pre-piano, uh, the, the Vox Continental Organ, uh, the Mark II uh, stage piano, that 88 fellow, uh, the Baldwin harpsichord, uh, and, and many other of the synthesizers. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've shown them uh, at, during seven centuries of keyboards, and then they'll come back again for everybody to see. But downstairs, uh, we have the story tone the song. So if, if you would care to, uh, by and by, I'm going to wander down after the lecture and uh, be happy to show anybody, you know, some of the things that it can do. And uh, I've now reached uh, right at the mark that I was looking for. 
So I will say, do I have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Well, I have uh, maybe three questions. Uh, chronologically, the uh, your slide had a remark on the Dynatone uh, about a, a, a new scale, an engineered scale. What does that refer to? Is that temperament? or? Uh... So the, the scaling is the diameter of the string and the length of the string oh. for any particular note. And of course, the, the piano makers can change that. And it's, it's an interesting physics phenomenon. When you get it just right, the sound blooms at that point. Hmm. If it's too long or if it's too short, you'll, you'll kill the sound. So, you know, and, and you know, the, the joke is that, that all scale designers are, are mad. Uh, it, it takes a certain amount of, of uh, intensity in, in the thinking and, and what you come forward with to make those things work. But uh, a great scale designer uh, is, is vital to a company having a piano with a good sound. And then once they have it, they're very loath to change. So that's one question. Okay. So uh, and number two is, uh, how do you can you get replacement tubes for your Macintosh amplifiers? And what what would a replacement tube set cost today? So the the for well, the Macintosh, it's actually easy because uh, they, they use the uh, uh, 6L6 uh, uh, and for the amplification and then they go 12AX7, 12AU4 and, and things like that. Uh, believe it or not, tubes never ever stopped being made. Uh, we stopped making them in the US for a while, but uh, particularly in Russia, uh, when they were doing all of their bomb tests, they found out something that when you set off an atomic bomb, far away from the impact of the bomb, there's this electromagnetic pulse that goes out. And if you've got a transistor radio, it's, it, it's dead. It takes it, it, they, everything, it's like the antenna picks up this real high voltage speed spike, it goes through the whole thing and it just kills it. So, but tubes are immune to the electromagnetic pulse because they're already high voltage anyway. A high voltage pulse is nothing to a tube. So the Russians said, aha, we, we will continue to make sure that we have tube-based electronics. America went, oh, oh. And then we started a program as well. The Chinese make tubes. Why? It's essentially the same reason. But there's a big commercial uh, uh, market out there. The 2A3s, uh, are expensive as heck. Those, those guys, new old stock is $250. Uh, a, a good Chinese uh, version is at like 80. So those are expensive, but the other tubes are actually quite affordable. A match pair of, of, of uh, 6L6 six, six six, uh, you know, for your Macintosh will only cost you about $60. So not too bad. Number three, um, your project, your sampling project, um, do you have a is there a means within the technology to uh, reliably and convincingly achieve cross-string resonance and the other dynamics of rather than a single note? So, so that's that's one of the things that we did as as we were were, were working on this. Um, you know, obviously, you want to uh, you know get a note and let it decay, and, and that's one of your packages. But then you push down on the pedal get that same note and then everybody else is resonating and so that decay is going to be a little different than the one from when you had the pedal off so your your keyboard is very intelligent when you push on the pedal you're going to start getting the sounds from when the, you're, you're making those notes with the pedal and the press and and so it, you can really hear it you know and, and as, as you're playing uh, it's it's pretty neat and and why can we do it because memory became nothing. That's right. Um, and, and, and 1994K cost you a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. Do you know how much memory you can buy for a thousand dollars? It's in the, the many hundreds of terabytes you know, today. So memory became nothing. We're even sampling mechanical noise from the sustained pedals. It's cool. Yeah, and, and adding that in. So when you hit the sustained pedal, you're going to hear just a little. Just like you would at the beginning. Other question? Yes, sir. When you talked about the early uh, electronic piano, you said that 
one characteristic was it quite resonant, the strings would just ring on forever. Was there a damper device or something to control that resonance? There, there is, and, and it has a, a, a normal set of dampers in it. It's simply that when you, when you strike a chord, then the chord will last longer than any other piano. And you can use that to good effect, or you can say, I don't want that, uh, any, and of course, then, then you're playing more like Disordered Brain, where it just sounds like a regular piano. I doubt that he has the, the, uses the pedal at all on that particular piece. Um, but uh, but it, it, it's, it's this otherworldly sound because you expect the decay, and then when you don't get it quite the same way, it's like, well, go on. And that's what's going on. And when you go downstairs, you'll be able to hear that. Um, so it seems like a lot of this is about the development of pickups and the strings. Like, is there, a, and whenever you had, whenever you said about uh, Fender and and uh, and Rhodes working together, like, was there a lot of cross collaboration between like guitar, bass, electric bass, and these keyboard instruments? Because it seems like a, you know. It's the same technology, just more advanced. So I think there might have been, if, if, the, if the piano guys had lasted long enough, uh, the humbucker is, is a, a, a wonderful you know, modification of that, that winding to stop you know, hums from, from you know, occurring in your instrument. They had a different way to do it here. Uh, largely, it was turn the plug around um, <laughs> you know, so that you made sure your ground was, was the true ground. But you know, to your point, uh, you know, the, the, the piano guys stopped thinking about this, you know, after 1942. And so it was the guitar guys that would, would go on to truly, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of electronic pickups today. And you can, you can tailor them to get specific responses from your guitar. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about the beauty of the e piano is like the the roads and the world are sound nothing like a piano, but they have such a unique sound that came became like a, a pivotal sound in creating rock and roll and electronic music and all this other stuff. That Dynatone sounds like a piano, and it's just interesting to me that that's the thing that didn't stick around. Was the pianos that ended up the electric pianos that didn't right. sound like pianos. It seems like those all disappeared, but the roads and the, the whirly stuck around. Like, what right. do you think caused so, the so, 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 you know, you're, you're answering your, your, your own point. Uh, you know, by having a sound space that's quite different, then that makes it very distinctive and people yeah. wanted to use it. Uh, if it had just sounded just like a piano, then it's sort of like, well, the only value here is what? You know, particularly for, you know, a recording studio. You know, nobody cares how big the piano is. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, yeah, and, and, and I would predict in 100 years that we'll still be able to replace pickups and, and uh, you know, Mark 1s through, through Mark 5s and, and make them work because it's just a sound like no other. Something made me chuckle. My dad was 11, was at the 39 World's Fair. And he told me all about that TV exhibit. And never said one word about this. Morning. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> when I when, when I saw the lines to get into the TV exhibit, I went. Mm. <laughs> I've been in this space before. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Are you aware of the Baldwin pianos uh, that they made in the 70s? Uh, UNC Charlotte, where I went, um, had. A school of piano lab with no sound work, and each and the teacher could matrix in each piano and headphones only. And I rescued a few when they threw them away, but I piezo pickups. Sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, piezo. Uh, I I think I remember that, but you know that was specifically yeah. for the student piano, so that uh, that you can do that. I think they might have had one at USC Upstate too, like a smaller setup of those. I carried five out with skateboards, and you can, <laughs> yeah, you can patch in a microphone. And, Hello, uh, can you turn to page 25? And the teacher had a matrix on hers that, or theirs. <laughs> cool. yeah, that was pretty common in colleges, that you had a class piano, and you could teach multiple people piano techniques. The teacher would have a headset that could 
dial in any one of the students at any particular point in time. They offered, they had their own headsets to hear themselves, so it was not like you were hearing a dozen pianos at different times in a room. Uh, but it was a, a way of mass educating uh, people who needed to develop keyboard skills. But these had strings on them? Yes, they, they were very short scaled down. Okay. Keep, keep the tuners busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we bought a daughter, uh, 1997, 98, uh, electronic, little upright piano. She practiced on it, became fairly good on it. She moved out of the house. She left the piano. What do I do with it? Craigslist. <laughs> 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 you can record record on a floppy disk. Oh, wow. Ah, three and three and a half inch or five inch floppy? Three and a half. Okay, all right. Just make sure. Yeah, that sounds that sound like a Craigslist item. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, and uh, you know, I'll I'll be downstairs if you want to ask any other questions. Thank you.